<laughs> okay, uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, this week's show, I am absolutely delighted uh, and honoured to have John Bidwell with us. Um, throughout my life growing up in the shooting world, John's been right up there at the forefront of any shooting that I've done and anybody in this country of a similar age has done. Uh, he's done a tremendous job in promoting um, our sport going forward. And I don't think we would be in the position we're in now, um, certainly in this country, if not globally, without the input John's had into shooting. Uh, I'm delighted that he's come on for a chat tonight. Um, I should have done this interview a lot earlier, but um, having... Uh, listened to him for most of my life. I thought it was uh, better if I put it off and listened to him this evening. John, <laughs> it's great to have you on. Thank you very much for coming on. How uh, have you been during lockdown and how is it up in Suffolk? Well, it's going all right now. Now we're up again, George. Uh, it's, been, you know, it's been a tough old time, particularly the first lockdown. I mean, we didn't know where we were. Um, that was all a bit of a shock, you know, just suddenly, you know, we were flying along and then suddenly everything stopped. And uh, we had 30 staff to sort of uh, muddle around and look after and, you know, uh, sort out. So that was a very difficult time, really. A bit worrying, to be fair, because, um, well, not just for us, but for a lot of people, we didn't know which, you know, where we were going to end up. You know, I thought, where's this all going to end? You know, no one really knew. It was very difficult times. But... Um, Second lockdown, um, obviously we are in more control of it. We muddled through the first lot. Um, the, the second, you know, lockdown weren't so bad. We had it in, under control. We knew what was coming. So, you know, we just got through that and now we're opened up again. So we've got the shooting back on, first of all. And and uh, yesterday the, uh, the lodges came on tap. So we're back earning again. So we've had a few, you know, a long time. We're not taking any money, really. Yeah. But, uh, there's a few people in the few people in the country been in that boat, me being one of them. Um, you know, in our sport, you know, we got shut down right through the season and only did finished up doing 14 days out of 38. So, you know, it's uh, yeah. the whole thing has 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 been uh, been a, a disaster um, in a in a financial and and you know business sense. But as long as we're safe and 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 we've stayed well, there's a lot of people health-wise not in the same position as us so you know we've got to be grateful for that and um hopefully now with the vaccinations we're uh, we're starting to see the end of it yeah i hope you're right and uh well i yeah we're certainly uh i think everyone's feeling a little bit more secure now and uh, you know looking forward to the uh the future of uh, the rest of it but um yeah we're certainly glad to be back and open and particularly with the lodges i mean uh uh, they're fully booked, um, as you would imagine. You know, we're in the right business for that one. Shooting is, in, in all fairness, to the last term, uh, uh, we first opened up, it was quite busy first couple of days. It's been steady. It's not, you know, they're not all rushing in like they were. Um, I don't quite know why, whether there's some of the lost their jobs or whatever, but there's a lot of speculation out there what, what's going on. But I think it could be the weather, a bit nippy still, a bit cold. And uh, anyhow, we're getting into the season, so time will tell, really. But yeah, we're, we're fine. We're, we're getting along nicely. And uh, we took the opportunity uh, in the second lockdown to do a lot of renovations on the ground. We put all new roads in around the lodges and painted everything up and, you know, tidied up as we usually do when we get the opportunity. And um, yeah, so we're all ready to, you know, look forward to the season. Good. Good. Well, I, um, you know, it's always uh, the facilities always look really nice when we've come up there, and I'm and I'm sure adding to it can only enhance it. Um, now, you know, a lot of people that are going to be watching this don't know you as well as I know you, and and everything else. And and I and I just like to start off by asking you how you got into shooting, and 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 where did that all come from, and what did you do before shooting, and. And, and just very, you know, very briefly, if you can be brief at anything, um, on how you got into it, where you started and, and, and what that came from. 
Well, George, as, um, I, I didn't come from a shoot background. My father wasn't a shoot, and my family was. We lived in the town, but we did have my nanny used to live out in the, out in the sticks, out in a place called Culver in Mufford. Um, it was about seven miles out of town. I used to spend a lot of my boyhood over there, you know, uh, wandering around the fields with a catapult and fishing in the River 100 there and doing all the things, what, you know. We like to do as we're youngsters as a country boy, if you like, although I was brought up in the town, I was a country boy. And um, and because we didn't have all the houses around, a lot of stuff like we've got now. And uh, we used to wander, the, you know, we used to wander all over the place with catapults and bows and arrows and all sorts of things. And then eventually we got ourselves an air pistol. I got myself an air pistol. I was always keen on, on shooting and hunting and, I always had an interest in, but my father would never let me have a gun. He thought they were dangerous. But he showed me how to make a catapult when I was about five years old. And, and that all went from there. So as I grew up, um, I acquired these uh, different things. Like a, a, I remember my first firearm was a, a gap air pistol. You push the thing in and unscrew at the end and put the slug in it. And, you know, you couldn't hit much with it, but, you know. Anyhow, that all started from there. And then I eventually got myself an air rifle. And then from there on. And I used to hunt all around the fields, you know, and uh, and shoot rabbits, all sorts of things. I forget, good mind you. Did all that stuff. And um, my first shotgun, believe it or not, was a garden gun. It was a number three garden gun. And a Webley and Scott. And believe it or not, I used to creep through the the, the the undergrowth and through the the the, the, uh, the uh, kale in the and a lot of kale were growing and uh, I remember stalking through the kale when the pigeons were you know, rustling above me I used to get about ten yards away from them trying to line one or two up that was just were a premium you know we, I had a box of these little uh, blue I still got a box of them actually I still got a bubbled case little blue one. And um, I found a book. It was when I was going through all my old stuff when I moved out. Anyway, and uh, we used to use one of them. But you hit something, you know, when it's, you know, and that's where it all started, really, from. And, I, and then I progressed for a 410, one of these folding up 410s. I had another in a bolt action Webley again. And it weren't really. I, I was a late starter, George. I didn't really get into clay shooting until I was... Um, well, 22, I really started play shooting, I suppose, around that time. I did, I, well, I, well, a bit earlier than that, about 17, 18, I joined the Summer Lane Gun Club. I really didn't have a proper gun then. I used to, I had a breeder, uh, an automatic. I used to use the pigeon shoot because that's how I, I, I loved to shoot. I'm a self-taught cop, never had a lesson. So I had to go decoying. And, um, and of course, I learned to shoot other, other pigeons, you know, we saw. You know, just learn to do it. I mean, no one thought it was a decoy. He just did it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there was, there was anyone around then. I think Archie Coates was just coming on the scene, you know, when we were doing it. And that he was this guy, Archie Coates, who was shooting all these pigeons, you know. And, uh, and yeah, we, we just did it. And uh, and from that, I, I was shooting pigeons uh, on Bennett Estate and some of the uh, Solly Estate and all around the estates. People used to call me. And say they got pigeon damage, you know, crop damage. We used to go and shoot. But I did get into clay shooting until I was about 20, uh, seriously, in the competition. When I was about 22, 23, I, I went to a competition, a local. I remember going into Tilney's gun shop in Beckles. I just come off, I did this pigeon shoot, decoy, and I wanted a few more cartridges. And because uh, there weren't many, you, you know, you didn't buy cartridges in bulk in those days. That was a box of cartridges. That was 15 children a box, about expensive. That were in the early days. But anyway, I went into Tilby's there to get some cartridges one Saturday afternoon. And he said, Go to that turkey shoot down the road. This was around Christmas. I said, Turkey shoot, where's that? He said, Just down the road. Go so down at Old, um, Oldaby Pit. So I went down there, had a look. I turned up and there was all these guys standing there with badges on their jackets and all the rest of it. So I thought I'd have a go. So I got the old breeder out, lined up, and yeah, you know, I shot 10 straight and uh, end up in a shoot off with about three others. Won this biggest turkey you ever did see. 
And, uh, and in fact, when I took it on Tally, and, and we lived in a 28-foot caravan in those days when we first got married, you know, we couldn't get it in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> we had to cut it up in sections to get it in. Oh, don't forget that. So that was the first time I got a taste of that. And then I then I got invited to go over to um, Bentwater's Gun Club uh, and, and shoot um, on a ski range. I never shot around a ski in my life, really. And yeah, I went round and I muddled a, a 22 on the range. I always say, you want to take this up? And I thought, well, it won't seem that difficult. You know, I'll just walk around here and skate. And long story short, I eventually did take up a bit of that. Went back to Summer Lane Gun Club and got involved with that a bit more. And got on the committee. Ended up as competition organiser in the end. And uh, and there's when I met all my, all these old pals, you know, like Alan Secker, Dennis Rudd and uh, Wally Sykes. And, and uh, Paul Watson and all these people, you know, who, who you all know, and um, and Paddy Howe, of course, Stevie Cooper, they're all there, you know. So and they were all fantastic shooters. We were all a bunch, you know. We were all competing against each other, but they were a lot better than I was. I mean, I was just an upcoming. I looked at all this lot. And I thought I want to get good at this, you know. I want to do better. And I remember going to the first. Um, First uh, uh, championship because we used to hold the England championship at Summer Lake. But I never competed in it in the early days because I was always working. I was always helping running the shoot and stuff, you know. Um, but uh, I remember going the first British my first British championship in the seventies. I think that, that was uh, no, that was before then. That was uh, in the six sixty sixties. 768 or something like that. I went to the British Championship uh, at, uh, uh, in, uh, down at um, uh, where is it? West London. West London. Yeah, I went down there and uh, managed to uh, win unclassified because I won classified at that stage. We had an unclassified section. And I, I won a gun. Yeah, I, I won a, a Franchi. So, um, yeah, I thought, well, that was all right. So I, I kept on with it. And then and then we got and then we got into um and then because I, I I competed in the in the next shoot and uh and we used to go up to Roweth, the shooting times championship. Because there was only three major championships in those days. There was the British Championship uh, um, and then there was at Northall, and then there was the, the Summer Lane Championship, the England Championship at Summer Lane. And the shooting time championship at Rowers. And that was it. And that's what we used to do. We used to do the three. It was like a pilgrimage to go with those shoots because no one had a decent car. We used to, you know, get in the best car we could amongst us. And off we used to go. And that was Stevie Cooper, Paddy Howe, and myself, and uh, Mike Reynolds. And you know, we, I, I teamed up with a lot of people. Wally Sykes. I went shooting with a lot with Wally Sykes in the late. And, um, and then it progressed from there. Then I made the England team. I mean, the first year I, I made the England team. And I thought, why me, you know, got an England badge. Or, or I thought I was the business, you know, got the England, that first England badge. And we went up to Scotland and shot um, the England team for the first time up near Pet Lockery somewhere. I never forget that trip because we, Alan Secker organised a grouse shooting at the same time. And uh, we went and uh, at a walk up grouse shoot and uh, salmon fishing in the river, all for 50 quid. 50 quid for the week with all the lodgings and shooting and everything. It's unbelievable. But 50 pounds was a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I spent 500 quid, you know. It's still um, money. Yeah, I think no time to change. But we had a fantastic time doing that. And we did win the, you know, we won the, the event. Don't forget that. And uh, I shot for England a few more times, you know, and then I, and then in 19, uh, where would that be, 1974, I went to the first European Championship in Tours. Um, I was going to come on to, I was going to come on to that, but as I said to Henry today, this is going to be the easiest interview I've ever done. We're only one question in and you're already taken up for it. <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, come on. Another one. <laughs> what 
so when you started, I could tell you, you've been through so many guns and so many different shoots already. I've all lost track. When you started competing properly, what was your gun and cartridge combination? Well, when I got rid of the breeder, I bought an Iba. A what? Iba, which was a Spanish over and under non ejector. And that cost me £75. Right? I couldn't afford uh, anything else at the time. And, he, and I, that's what I shot with. That's what I shot for England with. And then um, I shot that for years. And then uh, eventually I did get myself an A1 brownie. But I started off with an IBA. Yeah. For and what cartridges? Anything I could get my hands on in those days. But Ely, Ely used to um, support the team a little bit in those early days. The sponsorship wasn't like it is now you know we got to uh, ely was the main cartridge of the day really um you know the little um super seven they used to call it then they came up with the plastic then they came up with the olympic blue and the olympic blue was the cartridge of the day that was the best cartridge 1300 feet a sec we thought the thought the world would change when that came out but brilliant you know but now it's all you know completely different these days so at what stage in this, at what stage in this uh, period, which sounds the way you've portrayed it to be about a decade, did you think I can earn a living from shooting? And what were you doing in the meantime if shooting was your hobby? Well, I was in the motor trade. Um, yeah, I doing crash repairs. And I started up in business when I, I had a little... You know, I was a one-man band at the age of 21. Um, and I started doing crash repairs and that. So um, shooting was still just a hobby, but I used to have to work all day and all night just to get enough money to go to the shoots of the weekend. But to answer your question about when did I see an opportunity to make a living out of it, I suppose when I started to travel abroad, and I used to go to these lovely clubs like at Lisbon and the Porto and all these places, and I thought, you know, they're doing it a lot different to what we are. You now they've got fantastic marble clubhouses with, you know, with gun rooms and all the rest of it. And I just looked at what we were doing and how far behind we were with that. And although, because a lot of these clubs, as you know, um, George and Lisbon and that were, uh, I mean, the membership in them days was like £5,000 a hit, you know, to just to be a member there. And it was all live pigeon shooting as well, you know. And the money was made up with that. But I always thought that would be really nice to set up a shooting ground with, like, the image of a golf course, you know, with a nice clubhouse and all that. And uh, and that's what I, you know, I, I tried to achieve, you know, right from the beginning. Although, you know, when I started it, um, it was at Hen Park, you know, but it wasn't quite there, the same there. But I always had the... The, the idea and the vision of doing that. But Hennam Park, Hennam Park, going back years, when you, obviously it was your first first venture and, and everything else into it, an amazing place and, and, you know, a fantastic terrain to be able to throw any type of target. You wouldn't think so in Suffolk around that marsh area, but it had some reasonable topography, didn't it? And, you could throw oh, right. stuff up in the air and down on the ground, um, and I, I used to love coming there shooting. And then, and then I, I always questioned the move to High Lodge, but then it became very apparent the more it went on because you had this scope to be able to do what you want there, really, and and did and and, and took it a stage further. Yeah, well, that all came about. Henham Park was an opportunity I took because what happened is uh, when I was a member of the Summer Lane Gun Club, it actually packed up, you know, because of reasons um, I think they, uh, Lord Summer Lane rent up and some of the committee thought, oh, it's too much money and that all got sort of, you know, um, knocked on the head. And all the equipment lay dormant for four years. And, uh, and I see an opportunity and I was trying to find a ground for we start summer late and it's how it all starts. 
and I and and the Earl of Stradbrook, who inherited Henham Park, left this wonderful estate, and he was the Earl. <laughs> he was a bit of a centric character. I knocked on his door, you know, and I I knocked on his door one day into the hall. I knocked on the door, and I said, "Are you the Earl of Stradbrook?" He called me Keith. He said, "I said." Uh, Okay, I said my name is John Biddle, and I I just wondered if you'd like to rent me a piece of your land. He said, "What do you want it for?" I said, "For a clay shooting club." He said, "Whereabouts?" I said, "Up at High Lodge." That was called High Lodge. That was a little lodge on the corner. He said, "Yes." He said, "I'll rent that to you." He said, "You can have that for five hundred pounds a year and fifteen percent of the take." <laughs> it's like that. I went, uh, um, yeah, okay then. And he, that's how he was. He just didn't mess about. So I said, well, I'll have to reply for plan permission, which I did, and I got it. So I went to the gun club and I said, listen, I've got this piece of land and I'm applying for plan permission. And they said, well, we're not interested in stuff about again. If you want to do it, John, you can do it. I said, well, will you sell me the equipment? They said, yes, we will. So they sold me the equipment. And I said, all started, all manual traps. I think we started off with about 70 bowmans and fairies and all sorts of stuff. I even bought the rank, the land rover. The money was that went to charity. I think we I think I purchased that lot for about 1500 or something, for three grand at one lot. But they 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 put all the money. That's how it all started. So we started a club and then we ran a few shoot. And that just took off. I mean, I was I got in there at the right time. I started that in about 1982. And it just took off. And uh, and uh, and the rest is history, really. So unfortunately, the Earl of Stradbrook, um, I was there for three years, and then he decided he wanted, I wanted the lease. I said, he, he said, Well, we'll give you a lease. We give me a seven-year lease. So anyway, um, that's what they did. And uh, so when that all finished, I had to find somewhere else. About a year before it was all packing up, so I was wondering where I was going to go. I was thinking about going over to America and and, and doing stuff, you know, and moving over there and doing a bit more there. So I used to do a lot in North America quite a lot in the 80s. And, um, and then the plan came up, fell down the road. So I went and bought it, 100 acres, and... Uh, the rest of history, really. Okay, so so that so you got you're now at High Lodge, and obviously, as we've touched on earlier on, European travel and world travel is starting to happen. Um, when did you first go abroad? What was your first shoot abroad, and um, what did you think? I mean, it's so vastly different, isn't it? What did you think? What I mean, it must have opened your eyes up and blown your brains out, I should think. Yeah, well, I remember going there with uh, Dennis Watson and Dennis Rudd. We we took uh, Dennis Rudd's uh, Hillman Links down there. So that's quite a new one. An estate with the tents and everything. We went camping. We went down to Tours and got the uh, European Championship. And, uh, oh, that was fantastic. I mean, that was a real eye-opener. And... Um, yeah, I, I, I shot quite well in the first sort of couple of days, and there was a three-day event. And um, and the old gun broke down. The old Ivor gave up on me, so I had to borrow a Frenchman's gun in the middle of the squad. Mine broke down after the first shot. Firing pins broken it. Same thing there. So anyway, the, uh, I borrowed a Frenchman's gun and shot my first 25 straight. Frenchman skipped <laughs> So that was my first 25 straight at Vintas. And uh, I was doing quite well, but then because so I couldn't use that gun all the time, I had to get and get another gun. The rules then you had to have a sticker on the gun, you see. You had that gun you used to have a sticker on it and you couldn't change the gun. So you so anyway, I had to borrow another gun and re-sticker it up and everything else. Now 30 years, that was 30 years to be like it those days. And I, I don't think I'd do very well. I fell out of bed a bit there, and I ended up coming 47. I remember, I remember that George very well because um, I remember seeing I think that Wally Sykes, Brian Wells, Brian Heberditch, Paddy Howe were in the team, 
and um, and they, they did win at the French one. The French used to dominate that sport. Really were good at it, you know. And um, and Tiny Barlow was the team manager, old Tiny. Um, and uh, I just thought, you know, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. I want to be there where them boys are, you know, when that whole national anthem was played and all the teams were, you know, up there parading and everything. I, I want to do that. So I uh, I set about at, um, trying to achieve that. So I got rid of the old Hoiver and I bought myself a brown and lightweight cane, eight seven and a half inch barrel with the old narrow rib, the narrow rib, and a, and a swan neck stock. Honestly, and I used to carry it around in the mutton leg, in the old mutton leg, you take it and stuff it in the mutton leg. And I took that all over the place, all over the world. That was going. And that was covered in stickers. Any of all the events, and I could shoot that thing. I could shoot that little gun. And um, yeah, and in 19, um, what I did, I used to smoke a bit in the, I packed up smoke because I couldn't afford to do all of it. I wanted to achieve what I wanted to do. So I, and we didn't have all the facilities to practice like we have now. We haven't got a lot of shooting ground with automatic traps and one such a thing, you know. There was a little shooting ground near us. Um, Popham just outside Yarm, that was run by a little guy called um, Billy Bell. And uh, he lived on the site and he had a ski range, which the Americans built the Brown and Root when they were in Yarm, you know, with the oil industry and things were big. They bought, they put this couple of ski flats in there, German traps in there. And we used to all go over there and practice, you know, when you wanted to. So that was brilliant. So, did. I used to go up there every Wednesday, 75 cartridges, right? And I used to practice 75 shots. It would take me three hours to shoot 75. And when I called Paul, George, I meant it. I didn't want to waste a shot, you know? And I built up a repertoire and I taught myself the basic technique of what I use today, you know, as it turned out to be the movement shoot method. But I did it all with trial and error, you know, stance, hold position movement you know so i built up this 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 way of shooting and i and then when i went for the selection i put it into practice well and it took me a little time to get this all together but slowly slowly um in 1977 i managed to make the or qualify for the great britain team and i shot for the first time in 1978 which was up barbara so um that was my first, you know, uh, Great Britain team. Ten years ago. and I was I was in the team for, for forever, forty-seven years. Of I think got all together. I mean, no, apart from being ill or something happened, you know, or might I just dropped the target to select make that one, but then I was back to the next one and so on. So I had a long reign of being in the Great Britain team. Um, yeah, so fantastic. Yeah, well, those. One thing's for sure, it's a record that I doubt will ever be or 